I remember a man saying in one of our men's groups, he said, listen, our wives or our spouses, they're not looking for a reason to leave. We've given them plenty of reasons to leave. What they're looking for is a reason just to one. stay. Just one. Yeah. Huge. Mic drop. That's huge. I've got two incredible people who are doing, in my opinion, God's work and helping couples figure out how to stay together after an affair, after infidelity, after a betrayal. And betrayal can come in many different forms. Today, we are talking to Danielle and Hassani Pettiford. And these are two folks who specialize in doing exactly that, helping couples come together. Um, recovery after an affair. And they've been doing this for many years, helping hundreds and hundreds of couples figure out how exactly that is possible to have a better 2.0 relationship. Today, we're specifically talking to them about those things the unfaithful partner needs to make happen, what they need to do, some of the biggest mistakes and pitfalls that they want to avoid, and those things that they need to do to improve themselves to make that transformation possible in their relationships. So Danielle and Hassani, thank you so much for joining me again today. Thank Thanks you. for having us. So you guys have been together for a long time, married 19, going on 20, got four kids. Yes, ma'am. Been through some highs and lows, I have to assume. Mm -hmm. Of course, of oh, course. Yeah. I think our pain turned into our purpose and that allows us to do what we do. Isn't that so interesting that I think a lot of young couples, I know this is true for me, when I re specifically remember at my wedding shower, there was this game where they went around the room and had each of the women give advice and all the older women, you know, now they're probably like my age, but like at that time they were like older women and they, I remember them all saying like, it's going to be hard. You're going to have some really lousy years, mm. but stick to it. And I remember thinking, no, no, I don't want to hear that. Like, no, it's going to be right. all unicorns and rainbows. And, um, you know, there, those really, really low points in our marriage are the reason why I think people look at us today and say like couples goals, um, mm. because there's these periods that like before social media and even during social media, like you don't, put those you don't take a photograph of the two of you when you're in the middle of a fight like we no. see everybody's highlight reel but honestly one That's... of the reasons why we are so in tune with each other um we are so emotionally connected and our relationship is so much better today is because we've worked through some really ugly gnarly times and in fact betrayal so yeah. the people who listen to or tuned in on my show you probably are aware of the fact that um, I discovered that my husband had been gambling for like 10 years of our marriage. And when I did discover it, I first thought that there was infidelity going. I was certain that he was cheating and I was ready to, I put on my investigator hat and I, you know, did all the research and I, I saw all the phone numbers on the, um, a phone bill and when they were 800 numbers i thought oh well this is this is, must be a porn line this the secrecy the behavior the tension between us the lying the things that didn't add up it all in my mind woman's intuition i'm like there's an affair going on here um but it was in fact a betrayal and i think that anyone who's listening who's experienced betrayal whether it is gambling or drugs or an affair it's it's really difficult to move forward from that, but we often point at the unfaithful partner and we villainize them. And uh, for my own personal experience, once I made the decision that I wanted to stay, I realized I couldn't, why would he stay in a marriage if I was making him feel horrible? Like, why would he stay if all that I could dump on him was more pain and shame and embarrassment mm -hmm. and like what would be the motivation for him to change because as we know people are motivated to change when they feel loved and it was really hard to make him feel loved when i also wanted to pinch his head off mm -hmm. um so i wanted to have you guys back on the show today to speak specifically to the spouse or partner who was the unfaithful one. And if you can share mm -hmm. for us, what are some things, first of all, that we kind of need to understand and, and keep in mind when we're talking to the partner who was unfaithful? 
We, we did a last chance weekend and there was a gentleman who began to share. And he said, you know what? It's not like I woke up one day and said, today is the day that I'm gonna destroy my family. That wasn't my intention. I wasn't doing what I was doing because I wanted to end it, because I wanted to leave, because I wanted to cause hurt and pain. I was hurting on the inside and didn't know how to properly deal with my hurt, my pain and my brokenness. And as a consequence, it resulted in bad behavior that destroyed the foundation of our relationship. And I think oftentimes to your point, the betrayed spouse demonizes and vilifies the unfaithful partner. It's hard for both. Like if I'm unfaithful, right? And you villainize me, I'm the villain, you're the victim. Mm. At some point in the recovery process, we have to remove those titles. Yes. Because if we don't, if you always look at me as the villain, then how can you develop intimacy with the villain? Mm, Why yeah. would you want to? Yeah. You know? And so there's so many men and women walking around with a tremendous amount of shame because let's just take a person who's uh, guilty of a crime. They've gone to jail. They've served time. They've gone to prison. Then they get out. But once they get out, they're reminded constantly of what they did. And they're imprisoned even outside of the jail. Yeah. And so likewise, in a relationship that happens as well with a hurt spouse does not allow that partner to move on, doesn't allow him to heal, doesn't allow him or her to become the best version of themselves and they remain trapped. Absolutely. And I, and I think there are other dynamics at play. I mean, when we're talking about betrayal, I mean, you just talked about, you know, financial betrayal, you've got infidelity of all kinds, lying, you know, stealing, um, doing other things. So there are lots of forms of betrayal and all of it is rooted in their own brokenness, right? So they already know about their brokenness. They've been lying. They've been trying to cover their tracks. Many, most of them suffer from self-loathing. And so now they're caught and it's out there and they already self-loathe and now they're loathed by you, the person that they want to restore with. So it is a, it's a fine line that we have to walk to make sure that there is full restoration um, for the betrayed partner and the betrayed, uh, the betrayer, because it's important for them to recover too. And unfortunately for the betrayed, they actually have to make room for that to happen. And that's why people talk about it being so unfair sometimes. Mm. So when we're talking about the person who's done the betrayal in those initial stages, right? So for those of you who haven't checked out our previous episode, I had Danielle and Hassani on, and we talked specifically to the partner who was betrayed. Mm -hmm. and what they need to do in the stages of recovery. And that was a great episode. So I'll link to that below. But for those people who were the betrayer, right, the unfaithful, if you will, um, what are some of the most, first of all, do they go through the same kind of, I assume that they're going through the same stages too, right, if they're staying in the relationship. But how are things different for them, like right in the beginning when, when what are some of the biggest mistakes you can make when hmm. you've been discovered? lie. That's the first <laughs> thing you do. Yes. You lie to cover your tracks. You lie. Or, or if you're in a position where you can no longer lie, you minimize. Ooh. Make Give light me an example of. of what that might sound like. It was just, mm. it was I didn't really, so either there have been months of an affair, but we just had sex one time. Right. So I'm minimizing what it was or I, I didn't really care about her. It didn't really mean anything. So therefore, it shouldn't it shouldn't hurt you that bad. So wait a minute. You compromise our relationship over someone you didn't care about. It didn't mean anything. And something so trivial, you allowed to get in the midst of this relationship. So when we met or or. All we did was all we did was have sex. Well, the question is, well, what did you did you allow? Did you sleep overnight? Did you cuddle afterwards? Did you have come? Mm -hmm. No, none of that. Did you ever spend any money on it? No, I never spent any money. Did you ever buy a gift during the hunt? No, I never did that. So because if we reveal all of those details, then it shows or give the impression that it was a lot deeper mm -hmm. than it actually was. Mm -hmm. And for many, it was because when I'm in an affair. I bring all of me into it, my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, my everything. And I'm lost in this betrayal. And it's, you know, we compartmentalize when it comes to our partner. But when we're in that affair, we're bringing everything in. Mm -hmm. And to reveal that 
we think is going to cause more hurt and pain. So we lie and we minimize and we and we share portions of the truth to keep our spouse from further hurting. Mm. Okay, so oftentimes the motivation there is maybe I'm going to cover this up so that I don't get in more trouble. Um, I'm going to cover this up because it's going to expose another lie, or I'm I'm going to uh, withhold information, which mm -hmm. is also a form of lying, because I think it's going to cause more pain. Absolutely. Uh, but what does the um, unfaithful spouse need to recognize when it comes to withholding information that we think is going to hurt our spouse? Like we're doing it for good reason, maybe. Like I, I don't want to tell her this yeah. or tell him this because it will it'll cause more pain, uh, but <laughs> What do we need to know about that? Here's the deal. What they think they're doing is covering and protecting. That's what they think that they're doing. At least that's what they're saying. But at the root of it, your spouse is still standing by your side after a betrayal. All they want is the truth at this point. I hear specifically wives say this to me all the time that I stood by his side through all of this. Do you think I can't handle your truth? Do you think that I don't already know? or I'm ready to walk. Why? Because they just won't give me the truth. All I want is the truth. And so what the unfaithful partner doesn't know is that telling the truth, the full truth and nothing but the truth actually helps to fill that bucket of trust. It's a drop, one little drop in the bucket of trust that, okay, at least they've come clean. Now I'm at ground zero. They've told the truth. What, what, what the unfaithful partner needs to understand is that as painful and as hurtful as your actions have been to your spouse. For them, what hurts even more is the fact that you've denied the truth for so long. Mm -hmm. So not only are you telling a lie, now you're now living a lie, which makes that betrayed spouse question everything. Everything. Yeah. everything. yeah, I remember that. Um, mm -hmm. When you are um, in this position, right, where you're, you, they have to just you we need them to disclose everything is it wise for the unfaithful partner to just bleh, like you know vomit everything out even mm -hmm. details that i didn't ask for or should the unfaithful uh partner should they wait to be questioned that's a very good question mm -hmm. well let's let's go with that train of thought i'll wait for the question to come the, the fact of the matter is the betrayed spouse can ask you ten thousand questions but the fact is, they don't know every question to ask. So yeah. if you only answer questions that have been asked, you may only know, the, that person may only know about 80% of what has happened, but they're still stuck because the 20% that hasn't been shared will help make sense of the 80 that has been. So we, in our full disclosure process, we prepare both the betrayed and the unfaithful for the conversation. Mm. We ask that the betrayed write down every question that they have, the facts of the affair and the feelings surrounding the affair. And then the unfaithful partner has to write what is called a written monologue where you unpack the details of the affair from beginning to end. So in that process, he or she reads the letter, the written monologue, and then the portrayed spouse can ask any questions about that letter. And then they get to their prepared questions. And then the unfaithful has to answer those questions. It's more comprehensive because now we're a part of it. Mm -hmm. And we're wow. here to help explain and rearticulate and repack what has been said so that they both come out feeling like, man, we, we got more out of this mm -hmm. conversation than all the other thousands prior to. Yeah, without this fighting. Is, this is why it is so important. It, it, it's such a time saver it's such an emotion saver to work with people like yourself who have a system that is is proven that this process works because i mean for the average person who's experiencing this you don't have a manual on how to deal with this yeah. you know yeah. and as you've mentioned in our previous chat it's not wise to talk to friends and family members about mm -hmm. this especially when you're at a state when you're most vulnerable and you're most hurt and you're most angry and you're most undecided. Yeah. Because they, they can't forget those things and they have their own motives and their own beliefs, their own expectations for your relationship. And you can get some pretty damaging, potentially damaging um, advice or people sharing your secrets that um, they have no business sharing them. So right. to work with professionals like yourself, I think like I, I, I tell people this all the time, you're going to save time and money when you go to the expert like that. That's why we do what we do. Right. 
And so I think that really makes sense to walk people through that process. What are some of the things that um, you have found most unfaithful partners have in common? Is there is there past trauma? Is there maybe in their own history, parents who were unfaithful? Is there a lack of communication? Are, are there some common themes? I'm going to say you, you can run the gamut on that, meaning that it, yes and no, maybe so, maybe not, right? It could be a, a, somebody from a perfect family, no issues, no trauma as a child. They're just cheating. They're acting out. Um, what I have found is that a lot of times when someone has been with their partner since childhood, mm -hmm. there is this developmental lag. And so they may have had a perfect upbringing, no issues, but they felt like they missed out on something in life. And so they step out, right? So this is detrimental to them themselves to their own character, but they do it. So it takes you in all kinds of directions. But one of the biggest things that, that I've noticed um, with the unfaithful spouse is that they want immediate exoneration, right? Ooh, so yeah. after the process, they want to quickly get as far away from discovery as possible, as quickly as they can. Right. And so they are literally kind of trying to skip the process, the healing process of the other person, because they just don't want to deal with it. So that to me is a, a main common theme for the unfaithful. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense. That's a human condition. The human condition. Mm -hmm. We want to avoid pain once yeah. we've the uh, unfaithful partner has been found out. Yeah. If they decide they're going to stay. I think what you're saying is they have to commit to mm -hmm. a painful process. Yeah. So what do you want to say to that unfaithful spouse right now? Who's like, I, un, you know, to, to commit to a, a painful process where I'm mm -hmm. going to feel persecuted, where I'm going to feel shame, where I'm going to lose all of my rights, where I um, mm -hmm. am going to feel emasculated or, mm -hmm. or uh, villainized if I'm the woman or call these <sighs> names, et cetera. Um, and I don't know if we're ever going to be better. Like, why would I do, why would I, why don't I just step out? Plus, you know, my affair partner was, they thought it was the cat's meow. I, I was, it was like amazing. And so like, why am I staying in this relationship where I'm going to be persecuted for years? Yeah. It's a powerful question and we get it all the time. And here's the deal. You do not get to escape the process. It doesn't matter who you're with. So the unfaithful partner thinks that they're going to avoid all of this ridicule, all of this issues, having to work so hard to rebuild the trust of somebody that they've broken and they've got history with. They think if they abandon ship and go find somebody else, start from scratch, it'll be easier. The problem is you brought you with you <laughs> <laughs> and you never fixed you. And so that whole idea of wanting to be exonerated, literally wanting your record to be sponged out, clean start, all the rights back mm -hmm. right away without a process, it just doesn't happen except for once in a while when we have a newer president and they do exon exonerate a real criminal, right? But in <laughs> most cases, I mean, hands up, you know, you got caught, the jig is up, hands up, you drop everything that you've been stealing and hiding and covering up, hands up. And that's the position because you're no longer covering, hiding, no more secrets, full disclosure. And that's the process. I, you know, it's funny we're using this jail concept a couple yeah, times, yeah. but really when you think about it, when you get caught in a crime and you go to jail, you you lose all your privacy. So yeah. You are in recovery. And that's what the unfaithful partner needs to understand, that if they okay. don't go through the recovery process, they're going to go to the next relationship and repeat the same mistakes. So is that something that you think in order for a... Um... A relationship to work in this way that the unfaithful partner needs to commit to the entire process like they need to understand that it it does mean yeah you've lost some privileges yes you have lost some freedoms and they may be restored as trust is restored but it is going to be a process yes so i just want to if you if you don't mind this is one paragraph that i read to every unfaithful partner when we start this process. And if this is not a sobering uh, message, then I don't know what is. It says this, in choosing to stay married, you're choosing a path that's long and hard, longer and harder than anything you've ever walked. You're gonna be kicked in the groin, hopefully met metaphorically speaking, ignored, screamed at, rejected, and stonewalled. 
You're going to feel disrespected and minimized as a man or woman. Your needs are not only going to go unmet, they're going to go ignored at times. Mm -hmm. There will be more setbacks than advances, and it's not going to feel good most of the time. And if your marriage is at the bottom, put your big boy britches on because it's not going to feel good for a long time time. Th that's the mindset that you should have going in. And I think what happens is many people don't understand what the recovery process is. They think it's going to be a skip in the park. And, you know, after a couple of sessions, we'll be good. It is going to be the hardest thing you've ever had to do, but it is worth it. And so how can we expect to really cause this level of pain and to get away without any type of process? And so once you have that mindset, you can then enjoy it. Now, let me just say this. I remember a man saying in one of our men's groups, he said, listen, our wives or our spouses, they're not looking for a reason to leave. We've given them plenty of reasons to leave. What they're looking for is a reason Just to one. stay. Just one. Yeah. Huge. Mic drop. That's huge. Yeah. And if, in, in showing up in honesty and transparency and willing to change behavior, that's what they're like. Give them a reason to stay because I'm here. I'm still here. I'm still willing to give you a chance. What are you going to do to keep me here? Mm -hmm. It's through your actions and your behaviors that will determine whether they can move forward. So uh, again, my own personal experience when this happened with Brett and I, I remember feeling so angry with him because he was saying all the right things, but I wasn't seeing emotion. I was like, why aren't you crying? Why aren't you begging for me? Like, you know, you're saying you want to stay, but like, I need to see you like writhing on the floor, holding your stomach and just yeah. saying, you can't believe that you had the greatest gift in the world and you blew, you know what I mean? Yes. And, um, he just didn't have the same emotion that I needed from mm -hmm. him. And that, that just, he just never did. Um, but he, he, but everything else was there. Is, is that common? I'm so glad you said that. <laughs> there's a, there's a book out there entitled men cry in the dark. Wow. Mm. And, and oftentimes men do have a tremendous amount of emotions when men get along with other men in their own social space, they have conversations that they would never have in front of women. They pour out, they cry, they hold each other up in ways that you wouldn't even expect. There's a high level of vulnerability when they feel safe. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes men don't feel safe uh, with their spouse because either there's a lot of pain that is being thrown at that husband or their idea of what manhood and masculinity is doesn't allow them to peel back that later layers and be emotionally naked and vulnerable with their spouse. And so that's why in this recovery process, when we get to trust building and effective communication, there are levels of intimacy that we walk spouses through so that they can share what's really going on on the inside. I remember Danielle saying to me, until I really emotionally cried in front of her for the first time, she thought I was an android. She thought I was a robot. She thought I, I, I didn't care. I'm like, you don't have a soul. Yeah, and then yeah right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you find that there are instances where a couple or a partner, I should say, is unfaithful? as their effort to get out of the marriage. Like that's, they wanted to be discovered. They, it, it, it mm. was over for them long ago and they just didn't have the, excuse me, didn't have the balls to, to bring it to her attention or to his attention. They and so they- They didn't have testicular fortitude. <laughs> that's right. They didn't right. have a testicular fortitude. That's my new line, <laughs> I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> to come forward and just say like, this ain't working for me. So they, it's a, a form of, um, uh, Rebellion. Yeah, rebellion, or they're just sabotaging the relationship mm -hmm. intentionally, yeah. though, intentional, intentional. sabotage. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. uh, one of our practitioners says they're cowards, in essence. Mm -hmm. And so rather than uh, having conversation with their spouse about the fact that they're not happy, yeah. they want to move forward, you're right. They yeah. will do things intentionally to sabotage the relationship to force their spouse's hand. Uh -huh. That's why they become very sloppy yeah. with their affair. So they will allow things to be seen evidence recordings pictures they'll leave it all out there because they want their spouse to do what they don't have the ability or mm. capability to do for themselves yeah and that situation is it more likely than not that the couple will dissolve that's not well here's the reality 
you'd be surprised. Hmm. There's so many spouses who will stay no matter what, because maybe they're staying for the wrong reasons. They fear being alone. Hmm. They don't believe that they'll, you know, I'm of a certain age and I don't think I could ever find someone again. So if I'm going to deal with a no good man, I'd rather deal with a no good man that I know about than one that I don't, because I'm going to repeat the cycle all over again. Or woman. Or woman. Mm -hmm. I'm staying because of finances. I'm staying for kids. So we've seen certain individuals literally cheat in front of them ongoing, and they will not leave. It's not so cut and dry for each couple to say, if you're having an affair, it's over. Because all the threats, all the ultimatums, all the I'm packing my bags, I'm ordering the moving truck, I'm filing papers. We've seen people file papers for divorce. There's a date on the table and they will still try Stop, to stay back. in that relationship. Yeah. So there's, there's the, a lot of times the conflict between a couple is an outward manifestation of an internal conflict and struggle and insecurity and issues that we have within ourselves that keep us attached to trauma, this mm, trauma bonding yes. and all types yes. of things that keep us in bad relationships. Yes. How often do you recommend once um, the affair has been discovered that the offending party or the unfaithful party, they need to get into therapy individually? Or, or do you think that the first step is to go to therapy together? Okay. So I, we, this is a good question. We always recommend that the first session be as a couple. And I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you why. If you go individually to your counselor and she or he goes to their counselor, they're only getting one portion of the story. And so if they're only getting one portion, they're going to counsel you as best they know fit based upon what they know. They don't have the full story. So we always encourage that the first session be together so we can hear everything. And then we will say not start with individual, it should be done simultaneously. So we have practitioners that will send you to that specifically deal with that man and that woman. And as a team, like we form together like Voltron, mm -hmm. our practitioners come together and we may talk through what's being done, you know, to help them best advise through the individual counseling. Yeah, and I just want to add that the most successful couples actually just stay in counseling. Like they've been with us for years, they value it. Even if they're not coming weekly, they'll go every two weeks or monthly, but they stay tied in. What hurts is when someone disappears for a year and there was another infidelity and everything fell apart because they didn't have the support. So the most successful couples stay in some form of counseling with us. And to that note- Plugged in. Let me just say yeah. this. A lot of times people will short circuit the process because after three, four, five sessions, they feel so good. Right. And they've mistake, they have mistaken feelings for a foundation. Right. You need a foundation to undergird the feeling that you have so that it's maintained. And so that's why we say you got to be in there for a process to get you to the final destination. I mean, even we, and we say this all the time, we have to go to counseling too. Sure. You know, we, we derail, when we derail, we know what to do. We get back into the counseling, we get tied in, like you said, and it's important to do that. And to Hassani's point, people forget that everything is like a muscle. If you stop working it, then it gets weak. And that's yeah. the truth for us internally as spiritual beings. That will we that we care about we have to take care of you know if you mm -hmm. want to have nice teeth you need to go to the dentist yes um, so what are some of the things that the unfaithful partner because I, I know you've worked with a lot of couples some of the biggest mistakes that they've made after the disclosure that have made things worse and created more problems uh, aside from the uh you know continuing to lie and cover up Okay. Mm -hmm. Continuing to re remain connected to the affair partner where they say, well, we're just friends now. Like a lot of times the, the workplace is a hotbed for infidelity. Mm. So I'm having an affair with someone I work with and guess what? We're not doing it anymore, but we're still talking. I mean, we're just having a conversation. We still text. We still get together for lunch. I mean, we're not having sex. So it's not like we're in an affair and, and you, we don't understand that that relationship is a trigger for the spouse. In fact, yeah. that job, that workplace may be a trigger for the spouse. And I think here's the big issue. The unfaithful partner does not empathize with what the spouse is going through. Okay. That's huge. So empathy by definition, if I can give you one, it is seeing through your partner's eyes, hearing 
with your partner's ears and feeling with your partner's heart. When I can begin to experience from their perspective what they're going through, it gives me a high sensitivity to your journey, compassion for what you're going through. And 99% of the time, when people think, well, once you're a cheater, you're always a cheater. How do I know that you'll ever change? A person will literally stop cheating when they can feel the pain Mm. that their partner's going through. Imagine going to a hospital, seeing someone in the bed who's sick. I mean, you have compassion, I guess, for the sick person in the bed, but you don't feel what they feel. If a doctor were able to stick a needle in that sick sick person and intravenously take out the pain and then inject it into you for 60 seconds, if you could feel what that pain felt like, you would have such a different experience relating to that person. Relationally, the process we take people through, they are allowed to feel that pain and that's when the shift begins to change. Mm -hmm. What are some of the most damaging things that can be said by an unfaithful partner? Because I, you know, obviously in our last chat, we talked about how it's not uncommon for the um, betrayed spouse to want to take revenge, to be spiteful and angry and sometimes even violent. And not that we're condoning any of these things, but that's going to be coming your way, right? If you're Mm -hmm. the unfaithful partner and at a certain point, you probably have to say like, this is a human being and how much can they take? Or it's like almost like an animal being you know, uh, backed into a corner, eventually when they're being attacked or cornered, they're going to bite. So what are some of the most horrifically damaging things that an unfaithful spouse or unfaithful partner needs to avoid at all costs? Blame of any kind, Mm. any kind of blame is detrimental because at the end of the day, these are choices that you made And oftentimes the unfaithful partner will blame and say that you weren't sexual enough. I didn't have enough sex. You, I couldn't talk to you. You didn't clean the house. I didn't like the way you cooked the food or a zillion other things, right? Blame is detrimental. Mm -hmm. 1000%. Now, now here's the, the reality. There are these relational patterns that can create a high probability for divorce or an affair but the relational issues are separate from one's decision. It may have influence and created an atmosphere for me to make a bad decision, but I can't blame you for what I have done. I've got to take ownership for what I've done. And we say this, if if I line 10 people up and I took a lighter and lit it and I force everyone to stick their hand out and I put the flame under all 10 people, their reactions are gonna be different. Someone's gonna scream, someone's gonna cry, someone's gonna ball up a fist and punch me, someone's gonna sit in silence. Well, they're facing the same pressure. What causes them to react differently? Right. Once they face that pressure, what's, what's in them is forced out of them. Right. And so oftentimes there's these inner issues that we've been carrying into the relationship, residue from the past, idiosyncrasies, inconsistencies, contradictions, faults and flaws. And when faced with that pressure, that stuff comes out of us. Yeah. So there's that's why that internal work is so critically it important. Is. So you take ownership for what you have done. Right, and let me just, I wanted to bring a little balance to that because we never want anybody to think that anything that they did had anything to do with what the spouse did who was unfaithful, right? But of course, we all have our issues and our idiosyncrasies that we bring to the relationship prior to any unfaithfulness, right? Those things exist, but they exist mutually, right? So whatever hell I'm giving you in this relationship, you're giving me some other hell in this relationship, right? If I leave dirty dishes in the sink, you left socks on the floor. Whatever the idiosyncrasies in are in your marriage, though they are valid, though they are frustrating, though they may piss you off, cause arguments, cause you to stop speaking, none of that is an influence in your decision to cheat. And we don't validate that. And mm. that's why blame is so dangerous. Mm. Yeah. But when your spouse is lashing out at you, you're just taking a beating, right? Because oh, I mean, yeah. I talk to couples who've gone through this and, you know, just the pain and also like trying to get a reaction from that stoic partner, that mm. partner who's just like trying to survive it. And maybe they're dissociating. I don't know. But they're, they're, they're not, they don't seem to be feeling the same level of pain because how could they? 
that the betrayed spouse is feeling. Mm -hmm. And so the betrayed spouse is lashing out and saying these horrible things. And, um, you know, at a certain point, what does the, does the unfaithful partner have any rights in that regard? Like what, what can they do to protect themselves? Because certainly they're in pain too. Absolutely. It's so funny you mentioned that. I just got a text earlier today from a unfaithful spouse who says, I need an emergency session with you because mm -hmm. everything I do is wrong. Everything I try to explain is cut off. She's becoming physically violent. It's just it's just too much. It's toxic. What, what do I do? I need help. And so this is why we reinforce the individual process that the unfaithful partner needs to go through. I think that the betrayed spouse oftentimes realizes they need help, but the unfaithful spouse oftentimes does not. And they think they could short circuit the process and I just made a decision I wasn't going to do it again. So that should be enough, right? No, yeah. that is not enough. You need strategy. You need to know how to diffuse the situation. So we walk couples through how to create a safe environment and when it is no longer safe, how to back away, okay? And, and establish rules so that when things happen, you don't feel abandoned or rejected by me because I have to walk away. Because if I engage in this, it's going to go from bad to worse and from worse to even destructive. Mm -hmm. And so this is where that one-on-one -on -one counseling comes in, where we give them particular techniques to guide them through, you know, heavy situations. I know it's um, difficult for some people watching or listening to imagine having empathy for the unfaithful partner, but how is it you can help that unfaithful partner to deal with the incredible intensity of the self-loathing that you've described and the shame and the guilt and the pain uh, that they feel in the aftermath of this? Like, cause I can't, I, I can't imagine feeling all of those things about myself and at the same time realizing that I've put somebody else in that much pain. Like mm -hmm. how do, how do they take care of themselves if I may? Mm. Well, I invite uh, our clients into a process called the path to true forgiveness. And in that path, on that path, they learn how to number one, accept what they've done. That is really important for them to accept and then acknowledge. And um, that is part of the process, but it's a separate process with forgiveness because I'm not only accepting that I've done this, but I'm acknowledging the hurt and pain that I've caused to someone else and to myself. And then we move into the process of forgiveness. And the interesting thing about the unfaithful partner is that they need forgiveness, they're seeking forgiveness, but they actually forget the step of forgiving themselves. Yes. And that's what we uh, talk to them about exoneration and how God has exonerated you and giving that, you know, Jesus' sacrifice as an example of true exoneration when you have actually turned the table about face and you're doing something different. And so we lead them through that process, process to acknowledge, hey, I'm broken. I screwed up big time. I've mm -hmm. acknowledged it. I own it. Now it's time for me to forgive myself and hope that my spouse yeah. can also forgive me as well. And then, and then coupled with that, this is why there is such power in group. So in addition to the individual sessions that we do in the couple sessions, we have a, a group, a moving forward program, a men's group, a women's group. And sometimes when you can hear what others are going through, it helps to put what you're going through in proper perspective. And then others who are possibly in the same journey and process become a support system for you. They begin to speak life into you. They begin to share how they overcame what you're currently going through because maybe they're three, four steps ahead in the process than you are. And so there's a collective intelligence when you're in the right community. That's why it's important to make sure that you're careful who you share what you're going through with because if they're not speaking life to you in your situation, then they're helping to make things worse. Mm. I'd like to ask if I could uh, some rapid fire questions from my audience. Sure. Um, so so uh, some of these are from the betrayer and some of these are from the person who was betrayed. So I'll start with this one, uh, which is from the unfaithful. When is this going to be over? I feel like I've lost all rights, all privileges, that I'm not even a human. How much longer do I expect that this is going to go on this way? It's up to you. It's up to you. Everybody's journey is different. Oftentimes, let me just say this, we have internal resistors within us. 
we all have a break and an accelerator. And in that process, sometimes we short circuit and sabotage our own process. Sometimes we push the gas and we're able to move forward. It's a general process we take everybody through, but they all go through it differently based upon their own idiosyncrasies, their own hangups, their own uh, willingness to participate with their partner. So it's going to look different for each mm-hmm. couple. And I, and I would add to that, that, you know, if you are doing all the right things, you know, you're an open book and you've um, experienced true transformation and you see that your spouse isn't coming along well, get into some good counseling because you really should not um, be trying to navigate this by yourself. And sometimes it's a conversation with a therapist or somebody that can just help your spouse see, hey, look, this is what's really happening. You're triggered. These aren't real experiences and helping them to begin to trust some of the actions. But at the end of the day, It is time to change the way you think and be an open book mentality type of person. There is nothing to hide. There's no need for separation. Mm. There's no need for autonomy and total independence. We should be interdependent Mm. on each other. And so when we have that mindset shift, it will feel less like you're a child and in bondage. Mm. Uh, So one of the members of my audience asked uh, her spouse um, was unfaithful. And recently she's caught in watching porn. And would Mm. that constitute uh, another betrayal? Yeah, that's definitely a form (laughs) of betrayal because even though it's not physical sex with another person necessarily, you know, you've, you've taken your eyes off of your spouse and place it on someone else and getting gratification and fulfillment in that space. And for many people, yes, it's a major form of betrayal. And, and this is why we need to put certain parameters in place and rules in place and have a high accountability. So you, you can bounce back, you can heal from it, but there is a process. Think about an alcoholic, right? Who, who goes through a, a recovery process and I've been you know clean for 86 days. And then on the 87th day, boom, I'm back. Now I gotta start from day one again and begin that journey. So we help people understand the power of porn and what impact that can have mm-hmm. on the person watching it, yes. the spouse who is now dealing with the spouse who's watching it and what impact it has on the marriage. Mm. This question is also from the unfaithful who said, um, I've never been physically attracted to my wife. The Mm. sex with the affair partner was amazing. And now my wife wants nothing to do with me physically. Why am I staying in this marriage? Mm. That's 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 a good question. That's that. See, here's the deal. When you don't know why, we here are here to help guide you through a process where you discover what that why is. Mm -hmm. So now I have questions about the question. Yeah. So when you say (laughs) you've never been sexually attracted to your wife, then what, because most relationships are initiated for two things, physical attraction and emotional desirability. So you look good, you make me feel good. So therefore it's all good. That initiates the process. The physical attraction can die out in the relationship because of weight gain, because of a number of different things. So I would want to go, I would want to go back to the beginning. What was it that drew you in the first place? I would deal with that. And then when it comes to the fact that the affair sex was so powerful and passionate, well, guess what? That's what happens in an affair because yes. there's a hot. Affairs are more about desirability than sex. The Mm -hmm. high desire and anticipation for something is what makes the sex so intense. Mm -hmm. It's not the actual physical interaction. It's the emotions and the anticipation. And we're pregnant with the possibilities of what can be. That's what does it. When I've been in a relationship for 10 years, and yes, we have sex. And, you know, sex has become a chore, a duty, a monotonous. But this highly intensified passion, that's what I'm searching for. And that's why you can't compare the two. They'll never be able to be the same because of the nature of the relationship associated with the sex. So true. Wow. So true. Yeah. Um, and, and what about um, comments like, uh, it, it's over, it's done with, it was years ago. Uh, just get over, like, when are you going to get over it? Comments like that at all helpful or hurtful? 
hurtful, minimizing, just t- mm. terribly destructive because it means the world to you and they're minimizing it. You know, some people think that um, just because I didn't have sex with this person, it was an emotional affair, it didn't mean anything. For some, it is way more meaningful that you shared your intimacy with somebody than having sex. I just dealt with a couple where um, there was uh, infidelity and it was just a kiss and it was destructive for the husband. He just was shut down because this woman of his shared her intimacy with someone and they don't have that connection. And so minimizing is so destructive. There was a couple we recently had, they'd been married, listen to this, for 38 years, Oh, okay? Yeah. The affair happened 39 years ago. Right, the oh, so before is- they got married? Before, Actually, they, before got married, they got married, wow. and they before. never, ever, ever dealt with it. So for 38 years, she's been carrying pain and security. And then they came and did an intensive with us and was finally able to go through the appropriate process to have that release and healing. So just because it happened 10, 20, 30 years ago, if you've never effectively dealt with it and just suppressed it and buried it and moved forward, trust me, it will creep up and become a part of your dialogue and, she, and conversation. And she actually wanted him to go ahead and send that letter, that closure letter. Yeah. 39 years later, later mm-hmm. he, she still needed him to send that letter to cut it off. Wow. Oh, so to send a letter to the affair partner? Yeah, that's one of the steps we take you yes. through that ends the wow. affair. You, because a lot of times there's a new term called ghosting, where I'm just going to ghost and disappear, mm-hmm. and, and or I'm going to I'm going to change my number or block the person. But yeah. to, that's not actually confronting the situation and, and ending it. And there's a closure process that we take every unfaithful partner through uh, to finally end. It's called the no contact contract, where you end that relationship, cut off all forms, and if. Because what happens is when we leave a crack open in the window or the door, sometimes it could slip right back in. And so if that person ever reaches out to you, there's got to be full transparency with the spouse where you make them aware of what's happening. Because what happens is, oh, man, she reached out to me. Uh, Let me just delete it and hide it and not tell my spouse. And somehow they find out and then they feel further betrayed because, well, what else did you delete? What else are you not telling me? It, It just unravels the entire process. Mm. Um, also from the, um, unfaithful spouse wanting to know how specifically to talk about the things that were a problem in the relationship mm. prior to the affair happening, because they feel like they don't have the right to have any complaints or any suggestions or, you know, cause it feels like they're again, uh, placing blame or making an excuse for why yeah. they had the affair, but yet there were these things in the relationship that weren't going well. There's a three-pronged process that we walk couples through. We focus on the marital recovery, the individual recovery, as well as the affair recovery. So we've been talking affairs all day, right? But in order to reestablish a healthy, mutually beneficial, long-lasting relationship, we have to deal with what was. And in dealing with what was, we have to deal with these issues, that have caused us to be in a dark place. And separate from the affair, this is what we were going through. So let's build a healthy foundation by going through a comprehensive exercise we take them through to resolve those unresolved issues. Yeah. And lastly, I wanted to ask you, are there certain signs that are happening in a marriage that are likely going to put you on the path of either infidelity or some type of betrayal. Again, you know, betrayal can be gambling, it can be porn, it can be um, uh, alcohol, it can be an affair. But are there certain things that when they're happening in a relationship, if you don't address them, you're, you're headed for disaster? I think one, and you can certainly share any others, uh, the, the, the biggest common denominator between all couples when there's been an affair or any type of betrayal is time. Time is a major issue. When couples, think about it, most couples spend more time together before I do than after I do. Yeah. Even though we moved in together and now we're living life together, 
the relationship now has become the last thing on, on our list of priorities because now it's about work and extracurricular and the kids and, and ministry and, and, and time with my boys or with females. And we'll squeeze some time in, I guess, at some point to date and to have a conversation. And we starve out the relationship and prioritize everything else. And that leads to an emotional disconnect. Yes. So couples oftentimes go from being soulmates to role mates, to roommates, and in some extreme cases, cell mates where they feel trapped in a marital prison with their spouse. Wow. And so time, a time starved marriage will fuel betrayals with people outside of that relationship. So when you say time, um, does this actually mean like time spent together or are there people who are in the same household and they're together, but they're not spending time together. Does that make sense? Both, oh. both. So there's a difference between quality time and physical proximity. Mm. So if oh, okay. and I are on the couch and she's watching TV and I'm scrolling through the phone, we're physically in the same space, but we're in two different worlds. We're not connected to each other. We're connected to the outside world. That's one thing. But then you have couples where one's, they're working different shifts. Right. So they never they're coming and going like ships passing in the middle of the night or maybe one's in the military or maybe they live in different states because of work or because of circumstances. Maybe the only time they see each other is on Sunday afternoons after four o'clock because their entire schedule. I mean, this happens more than you can imagine where they have been starved out of time, which can literally deaden the relationship within the marriage. And they build bonds with others. And that's where it happens when they're building bonds at work and with friends and other people. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're probably on the same page here, but I assume that we're, we're in agreement that when that's happening and you know it's happening, you know it's happening, you don't deny it, that's when it's time to get into therapy. And yeah. even if your partner won't go with you, it's important then you just start working on yourself because if if you wait, then you, you are heading for disaster. You are waiting for that rock bottom. And sometimes people can't recover from that. Sometimes it's just, you can forgive, but you can't forget. And the pain is too much to keep the relationship together. So I just wanna encourage anyone who's listening to, to, to recognize that that's happening, to know that it's normal, but also to understand that there are resources. There are people like, mm -hmm. Danielle and Hisani, who can help you. There are therapists in your area. There's online therapy. There's so many options available to you. And there's no shame in that. I mean, the shame I think comes when we we know things aren't going well and we just ignore it. Like we know we've got a toothache and we just keep skipping that dentist year after year until now we need a root canal and the tooth can't be saved. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Wow. Well, for those folks who are interested in working with the two of you, um, and, and obviously you do life coaching and marriage coaching, so they can reach out to you, even if it's not related to their uh, partner or a relationship. Uh, but how can they reach out to you or, or where can they get in touch with you? You can simply go to couplesacademy.org, that's O-R-G, to okay. find out more about our programs and, and our services. And we would love to partner with you to help you to become the best version of yourself so that you can have the best life and the best relationship that you can have. And we have an amazing team of practitioners with expertise in many areas with a number of different modalities that they use to guide you know, people through. And how often do you guys do your live retreats? Oh, uh, wow. We're doing them well, pretty much once a month. We have these they're last intensive. Chance. Yeah, okay. they're, and I thank There's you for saying that. We don't yeah. do retreats. We're out of the retreat business. We okay. do intensives where yeah. we're together for 10, 12, 14 hours a day doing deep dive work. And it's tiring and exhausting. And but it's it, intense. It's Just intense. Like said, yes. But it leads to a tremendous breakthrough. Remember, 95% of our clients are couples in crisis, mm -hmm. those on the verge of divorce, those impacted by an affair. And they're looking for something that's not lightweight. They're looking for something intense, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what they get. And we do them monthly. That's so amazing. Can... That's probably very transformational, I'd have to assume. Oh, I have to assume that's enough. very rewarding work. Absolutely. Yeah, we absolutely love it. It is. You guys probably have to totally decompress after that. That would be Yeah, so I'm ready. It's time. We just finished one. We just finished one um, this past Sunday. Major transformation. Ten couples from all over the country came in here with no hope 
looking scary, looking like they wanted to tear each other apart. And by the end of the weekend, they were hugging, embracing, crying, and just wanting to start mm. over. And it's it's a very um, exhilarating yeah. experience and humbling experience to be a part of, but it's time for us to get out of here. Yeah, we do. We need to yeah. check and, and, and Yeah, that's say, amazing. We do group intensives, but we also, for those couples that need a little bit more privacy, we do private marriage intensives that's not scheduled. That's on a first come first serve basis. So literally twice a week. I mean, because you're talking three days, that's six days. We're doing it twice a week. People fly down or drive into uh, our retreat center here in Atlanta. We take care of their lodging, their meals, just everything and create a wow. safe environment wow. for them to get the healing yeah. that they need. We're in the retreat center right now. <laughs> that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing your knowledge and the the work that you do is so purpose driven. I just I can't thank you enough for the work that you do and for sharing your knowledge here on the Shaleen show. And I, I just encourage people to check you guys out on YouTube. And of course, below in our show notes, we'll have links to everything that we talked about. There was a book that you wanted to recommend. Oh, yeah. Well, we have a book called The Audacity of Marriage, 10 Principles to Lifelong Partnership. <laughs> I love you can it. get that on Amazon.com. That's awesome. And there was another book you suggested that men oh, read. Yeah. So, yes. so this is a phenomenal book for men. What radical husband, what radical husbands do 12 steps to win and keep your wife's heart. Phenomenal it is book. recommended reading yes. for every male who walks through our office and female. I mean, I've had some of the ladies read it and they've taken so much out of it too, because they are unfaithful women. So sure. Yeah. Excellent. Well, again, thank you so much, guys. I really do appreciate it. Give them some love below in the comments, guys. Be sure to write a review for the show if you enjoyed it. And don't forget to subscribe. Again, thanks so much for being here, guys. I so much appreciate the work that you do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.